guys, it's the next morning. We finished Doctor Strange at about five to two, was it last night? Something like that. Something daft, anyway. Um, so yeah, we watched Doctor Strange. Uh, it is the introduction of Benedict Cumberbatch as Doctor Stephen Strange, a um, world-renowned surgeon who, after a car crash, um, basically loses the um, the ability to use his hands in the way that he's. He's previously used them. He's got the shakes, and it can't can't seem to control that. He he tries all kinds of um, sort of traditional medicine routes to try and rectify the problem. He even does some experimental uh, medicine routes to, to basically see if he can do anything, and and gets nowhere with it. He learns of um, of mystic arts that have basically helped another guy who could never walk. Uh, walk again, and so he goes to, to track that guy down and learns from them of the uh, of the ancient one, and and travels over to uh, to Kathmandu to find the ancient one. Begins teaching under the ancient one, and um, learning the ways of, of sorcery. And uh, yeah, and it basically sort of goes on from there, doesn't mm. it? Really, Caecilius is uh, an evil sorcerer um, who previously had studied with the sorcerers that uh, Doctor Strange goes to. St- goes to study with um, and has stolen some um, some pages of an ancient ritual to summon an evil entity from another 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 universe another multiverse if you like uh, called Dormammu and the plot basically revolves around Strange doing his training and um, ultimately defeating Caecilius and, and Dormammu it's a it's not a bad origin story it's um, we sort of said it was quite visually reminiscent mm. of Inception, didn't we? A little bit, yeah, definitely. There's, um, you know, obviously a great use of CGI in it. I think Benedict Cumberbatch is a great choice for the um, for the casting. He, he plays sort of like the smug doctor, humbled uh, by, his, by his illnesses really well. It's almost got that sort of Sherlock-esque sort mm. of um, air about him at the start. He's very arrogant and, uh, you know, there's, there's a scene in the beginning where another doctor's about to make a call... And he sort of says, "No, this is what we're doing. You know, if if you think about it, you've got to put this and if that." You know, and he and he gives an explanation, sort of thing, as to as to why he's right and the other guy's wrong. But he does it in such a way that makes the other guy feel about this big. He's and, basically exhausting, <laughs> is what it is. Yeah, and everybody around him sort of fed up with him. You know, his um, mm. Rachel McAdams plays his um, his ex partner Christine, and she's a colleague as well, another another doctor, and. Basically, you know, she she's had enough of him as well, and it's um, it's kind of a redemption story as well. You know, obviously he comes back and he, he learns the ways of the the sorcery and everything, and when he, when he does then start to reintegrate with his um, you know with his old colleagues and people again, he's you know he, he's somewhat redeemed. I didn't mind it. What did you think? It was all right. Yeah, it was a bit of a my brain started to hurt during the <laughs> during some of it. Some of the visual effects were a bit. You're know, disorienting to say that we were watching it half eleven at night. Yeah. But um, no, I thought it was a really good, um, really good storyline, really good character progression for Benedict Cumberbatch and everything. And yeah, Tilda Swinton does a great job as her character as well. Um, yeah, I, li- I liked I liked her character in this. I liked the ancient one. Mm. I I wasn't really familiar with the character other than you know I recognised the the character design sort of thing, mm. but I've never read any of the comics beforehand. Um, so really don't know much about this character at all, which you can probably tell from the way I'm describing and explaining the um, the plot, but there's the uh, the chap that Chiwetel Ejiofor plays, and I think he must be one of the, the sort of the, the quite high up sort of adversaries for Doctor Strange in the comics, and I, I had absolutely no idea that was coming, and then got to the end and was like, oh, mm-hmm. um, so if somebody coming in as a novice to this character as, as I was, that was, that was quite... Uh, I, I, I liked that reveal the first time mm. round. It's not something that really. Um, it's not one of those when you watch it back a second time though, and you see little hints that he's going to become that character. I felt that was a little bit out of, out of left field, but then again, I suppose it's, it's what happens in the in the source material, isn't it? Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a good cast and a good good story. Not as. Um, not as riveting, not as um, sort of encapsulating as, as some of the ones that we've watched, um, but it, it does what it needs to do to set Doctor Strange up for uh, for Endgame. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give that a 6 out of 10. I'm going to give it a 6.5. Well, there you go. Well, next we've got Guardians 2, so we'll see you after that. 
<laughs> so yeah, we've just finished watching Guardians 2. It's not a bad follow-up to the first one. We catch up with the team a couple of years um, sort of into their adventures as the Guardians. And they're, uh, they're on a mission returning some stolen batteries back to uh, a group of people when they run into Ego, um, who is played by Kurt Russell, and revealed to be uh, Peter Quill's dad. So the plot obviously uh, takes its twists and its turns mm-hmm. from there and un- unravels. Uh, it's revealed that Ego's the bad guy, and it's sort of more of a, a father-son story for Yondu, the character from the first film who's practically raised Peter Quill, um, since taking him to space at the beginning of the first one. And it's sort of the pair of them coming to that realisation that actually they're more of a father-son yeah. duo than than Peter and uh, an Ego would ever be. Um, it explores more of the relationships with the Guardians themselves and them becoming a you know a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family sort of a thing. Mm. Um, yeah, it's um, well as James Gunn himself said, it's really um, it's a it's like an independent film, but with the the scale of a massive you know massive um, sort of. Uh, piece of cinema or something like the Marvel Universe sort of thing, you know, it's a real character study and, you know, they're wanting to, to get to know, you know, sort of more about how each character's tick and stuff like that it plays beautifully into the Marvel Universe Definitely, it sets yeah. obviously uh, you know, sets more, more groundwork for what we what we know to become Endgame, mm. I right enjoyed it yeah, I did as well. Yeah, James Gunn was right about your know, character stories and things like that. We find out how um, Nebula comes to look as she is, and the history between her and her sister, and how, what Thanos made them do when they were younger, and uh, that was interesting to find out about because it's not just that Nebula hates Gamora. Um, it's you find out why she has a bit of a distaste for her and why she wants to kill her because it's because of her that she looks the way she does. You get to find out more about um. Yeah, uh, Michael Rooker as um, Yondu. as Yondu, yeah, and all that, and like you were saying about the father son relationship, they delve more into that, and I think that's really good. Not only is it focusing on the main character, but everybody else gets their own backstory explained as well. That's yeah, absolutely, like, yeah. it's um, a real ensemble piece, and it mm. works really well. Soundtrack's fantastic. Um, I've always loved the song Brandy, mm-hmm. and um, was first introduced to it when the uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers did a cover of it on their their Live in Hyde Park album. Um, and you know when you immediately just fall in love with the song that was one of those absolutely absolutely love that song and The Chain is possibly one of my favourite songs of all time uh, absolutely adore The Chain and uh, to, to see that used so prominently in here was, was yeah. great Mr Blue Sky as well for the opening thing James Gunn really knows how to pick a decent he soundtrack does. he really does um, I'm going to go 6.5 out of 10 for this one I'm going to go 7 there we go so we're on to Spider-Man now, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. We shall see you after that. We've just finished watching Spider-Man Homecoming, uh, the joint venture between Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios. Tom Holland returns as Spider-Man. It introduces us to probably um, one of the most comic accurate sort of Spider-Man uh, portrayals that we've seen in terms of he's in high school, um, he's the, the you know the outcast sort of thing um, and as well one thing about the portrayal of Spider-Man that I really liked was like all the one-liners and things like that which obviously Tobey Maguire and Andy Garfield did um, have hints of in their performances but I felt that this was more, more most like the Spider-Man that mm. I've uh, I've read before in stories the story is after the events of Civil War Peter's back in school and uh, you know hankering to go on his next mission with Tony Stark and the Avengers and obviously you know, um, world-shattering events don't happen every other day sort of thing, so he ends up getting a little bit bored, bites off a little bit more than he can chew when he uncovers the um, the plot to sell alien-infused weapons, and rather than uh, reporting it to Tony, tries to handle it himself and ultimately doesn't handle it the best way, so ends up having Tony Stark taking the gear off him and him having to prove himself that he's actually worthy of being Spider-Man. Uh, the villain of the piece is the Vulture, played fantastically by Michael Keaton. Um, bit of um, an interesting one to see Batman playing the bad guy. Mm. <laughs> uh, but no, Michael Keaton does uh, does a great job with it, and he's really menacing in parts. Uh, it balances the sort of the coming of age story really well with like the superhero spectacle stuff, uh, and like I say, even with the the Keaton performance, there's some some dark parts in there. There's a couple of moments where you really feel for his family once it's revealed that he's a villain and obviously he's going to go to prison and 
you know it's all all done done really well uh, lots of homages to the you know 80s pop culture and cinema and things like that there's one bit where spider-man is blatantly doing the ferris bueller bit <laughs> and they just tip the hat to it you know they, he runs through somebody's garden where they've got ferris bueller playing on a screen in the house sort of thing and it's like ah, oh, great movie <laughs> and it's like you know it knows where it's come from and it's it embraces that and um, really really good stuff um I was a fan of the Andy Garfield Spider-Man movies and was was disappointed at the time when they decided not to continue down that uh, down that path. But having obviously seen these several times now, that Spider-Man ones are the ones I do come back to quite regularly. Um, I absolutely love what Tom Holland's done and what the guys at Sony and Marvel have come up with together. You were saying, weren't you, mm-hmm. about obviously it was in the news not so long since that they were talking about not continuing the joint venture. I'm glad that they've worked that out. And that they it, will. Was, it was a drunken, tearful phone call from Tom Holland, which apparently sealed it. So. Yeah, I think I think he did sway some influence, didn't he? Because he said, well, I'll continue being Spider-Man for Sony, but obviously it stops him from being in like the Avengers movies mm-hmm. and things like that. But they've they've agreed to let them finish the Spider-Man trilogy, and I think, uh, is it one or two more appearances to start with, and then they'll go from there? But... Um, yeah, I really like what they've done with the character in the uh, in the MCU. Laura, what did you think? You've obviously seen this one before with me, but yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I really did. Um, I think Tom Holland. Yeah, no offense to Toby and Andy, but I think Tom Holland really does see it as yeah, he wants to be a superhero, but he doesn't quite know how to do it properly. If you know what I mean, he's got his own way of doing things, whereas Tony Stark wants him to sort of be a bit more responsible with it and it's like I don't know what I'm doing but I need to do something <laughs> yeah and it's, yeah. it's like that you know sort of that almost that childish sort of mentality mm. of well I'm right and you're wrong and the bit where he's he's done the bars and he's like well you didn't listen to me and he's like well of course I did I called the FBI and that's why they were there and he's sort of like he'd not considered the bigger picture I think mm. sort of thing yeah. You know? yeah he's desperate to tell people that he's Spider-Man you know that's that point at the party where he's planning to s- swing well, by he, Spider-Man well he's not desperate to tell everybody Ned's desperate to tell mm. everybody to be fair he he understands the importance at least of keeping that a secret yeah I guess yeah yeah but he really wants to tell that one girl that he's Spider-Man but at the same time he's the reason why this girl's dad's yeah, Michael Keaton has had to go to court and be arrested for smuggling all the Avengers weapon, things. Yeah, the weaponry yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so he's kind of conflicted on that at the end. But Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, what are you sorry for? And it's, I can't tell you. I can't tell you, but, but I'm the one um, who arrested your dad. <laughs> yeah. It, no, great film. Really enjoyed it. I liked it too, I, yeah. Um, I didn't mind the sequel. We're going to be watching that. It'll be the last film we're watching this marathon, actually. Mm. Um, didn't mind it at all. I'll be interested to see where they go with part three. Um, but for now, we're going to rate it and then move on to Thor Ragnarok. So I'm going to go an 8 out of 10. I'm going to go 8 as well. There you go. Thor Ragnarok is coming up next. So, we have just watched Thor Ragnarok, which is... How many films in is that now? Oh. 23, we've 6 to go. Haven't we? So 17 films in. And... Uh, it's a really great film. Like I said, I think after Thor: The Dark World, this one takes a bit of a, a bit of a change of pace. We're uh, we're very quickly um, taken away from Asgard, and we spend most of the uh, the film on another planet. I can't remember what it's called now, but we meet Jeff Goldblum, who's the uh, the Grandmaster, and he's basically pitting warriors against each other for for sport and entertainment, and. Uh, so Thor's captured on this on this planet, and he's he's put against the uh, the Grandmaster's uh, ultimate champion, <laughs> and it's the Hulk who's been there since the end of Age of Ultron. So, um, basically, yeah, the the sort of the plot goes on from there. We meet uh, we meet Valkyrie, who's um, played by uh, Tessa Thompson, and she's basically living in exile on this this other planet after after abandoning her post against a, a battle with the film's main villain Hela who is Thor's older sister the god of death she's taken over um, Asgard uh, upon Odin's death at the beginning of the film uh, and then really the third act of the film is them leaving the um, the the warrior planet and heading back to Asgard to basically sort of take on Hela and uh, bring about Ragnarok to make sure that she's uh, she's defeated uh, again, it's another great Marvel ensemble piece. Um, I really like the way that Taika Waititi, the the writer and director of this film, has taken the characters of Thor and of Loki, and he's really refreshed the whole sort of uh, mythological vibe that was going on for it, and brought the brought the science fiction and all that sort of stuff into it a bit more. And he's he added some comedy in there as well, hasn't he? Obviously, this this is a lot more. 
um, you know, a lot more comedic, and and it works. It's all it's a lot better for it. The the interplay between Mark Ruffalo um, as Bruce Banner and obviously uh, Thor is something that's always worked well in the Avengers movies. It, it carried over really well into this movie yeah. as well. Tom Hiddleston as Loki, a standout performance, mm. pretty much every every film that he's in. That's why he's a fan favourite. Mm. I, I really enjoyed it, and I can certainly see why this one was an absolute smash hit when yeah. it came out. It's a massive improvement on mm. Thor Dark World. I completely agree. I really do. You, know, you get to see that um, the relationship between Thor and Loki really come together in this one. They sort of make amends in a way don't they yeah and um you see that brotherly bond between them um it's not it's interesting to see um how valkyrie fits into all this you know you think she's just going to be some kind of background character who influences thor throughout the film but she isn't she's from asgard herself and how they just gradually slip that in there i thought was very clever as well, yeah, yeah. sort of build, build her up don't they and obviously mm. it's, it, you know it's coming a mile off the minute it says oh you're a Valkyrie warrior you know she's going to have that um, that pivotal moment where she you know mm. puts the armour back on and, and, and sort of does what she was destined to do sort of thing I just love the scene where Thor's in the arena and he's about to meet this prize champion and it, the Hulk jumps out and he just goes yes yeah <laughs> not the reaction people were expecting I know Thor. him he's a colleague from work I know him from work <laughs> yeah I like um, that yeah. I thought that was very funny absolutely hilarious stuff but um, I thought that the action the comedy uh, the sci-fi all, mm. all well balanced even the it. slapstick stuff that's in there there's one scene where uh, as you can see they're, Thor and Loki are in this lift and they do this thing called I don't want to do it I don't want to do help I need help and the next thing you yeah. see is just hit Thor dragging Loki out pretending get he's help. injured. Get help! And then just throws yeah. him at some people. I'm not, I'm not doing get help. I'm not doing get help. Get help! <laughs> um, it, yeah, just just really, really well done. Uh, we're going to move on to Black Panther in uh, a moment's time. I'm and looking then, forward to this one. Yeah, it's a really good film. I watched it when it when it came out on uh, Blu-ray. I missed this one in the cinemas. Uh, but got it day one for uh, Blu-ray release and, uh, and sat and watched it. Mm. But... Um, yeah, we're gonna do that, and then uh, this this day will will end with the uh, Infinity War, which mm. is quite a an apt place to sort of draw a line yeah. actually, and then we'll pick up tomorrow with the remaining four movies. Mm. But um, I'm gonna give Thor Ragnarok uh, a seven and a half. Yeah, so am I. So am I. So there we go. We'll see you after Black Panther. Hey up folks, so we've just watched the fantastic Black Panther, mm. the film follows on um, from where Captain America Civil War sets up the uh, the character, he's now ascended the throne after the death of his father, he's challenged with uh, ritual combat by the other tribes in the nation of Wakanda, um, initially nobody wants to, um, wants to challenge him, one chap from uh, a tribe comes forward and challenges but yields. And um, he, he basically sort of you know sets himself up as king. Quite separately to that, um, we have the villain of the piece, um, Eric Killmonger, played by Michael B. Jordan. He is stealing um, artifacts of, uh, of Wakandan um, history uh, that are made from the precious metal vibranium. Um, he's selling them to uh, Ulysses Claw, who we were introduced to in uh, Cap. Not. Uh, Captain America, Age of Ultron, Avengers, Age of Ultron. Um, the the point of him doing this is that he is wanting to um, to come back into Wakanda and challenge for the uh, challenge for the throne. It's revealed that the previous king T'Chaka um, had um, murdered his brother to um, protect Wakanda's interests after his brother had been selling uh, Wakandan technology and uh, the precious metal vibranium. To uh, to outsiders, which is not something that's um, that they have traditionally done. That that basically sort of sets up the plot. So Killmonger ends up challenging um, Black Panther to the uh, the ritual combat, and ends up for what we believe succeeding and becoming the new king of Wakanda. Uh, and then it's basically just that that mission of sort of overthrowing the you know obviously the the, the villain of the piece and making sure that everybody's. Uh, Everybody's where they need to be. Fantastic mm. cast, um, really, really strong story, um, brilliantly directed, edited, 
Uh, we've got uh, Dania Guerrero, is it? From, uh, Dana Guerrero. Dana Guerrero, sorry. Uh, the, the lady who was in The Walking Dead as Michelle. She's fantastic. She plays the um, the, the royal bodyguard. She's really good. Uh, fantastic in it as well as Lupita Nyong'o. Uh, she plays the spy who was um, in the Kia. And she's the she, she's like a former girlfriend, isn't mm. she, of, uh, of King T'Challa. Just, just a great cast as well as Letitia Wright playing uh, Shuri, who's the um, the king's sister, and also his sort of like his tech wizard as well. Mm. So sort of stuff that she does with the technology is great. And then obviously you got Martin Freeman in there playing Everett Ross as well. Just a brilliant film, mm. really compelling story. It keeps you gripped from the minute you start watching to you know. Uh, the, the moment the, the credits roll just a, a really really solid film if you've not seen it thoroughly recommend it I, I liked with this one as well obviously we we have the introduction to Black Panther in, in Civil War so we kind of hit the ground running with that and this film didn't really do anything towards the whole sort of building up towards Endgame whereas all mm-hmm. the other ones definitely have that on their agenda I liked that this one sort of just took a step back and was its own thing kind of a bit like Ant-Man did Mm. Um, it, you know, it sort of took a step back. It was just its own film. It was about its own characters, and then they left all that like, the world building stuff for like a little post credit sort of tease. And you know, I, th- I just thought it was a really, really good film. Mm. You were looking forward to this one, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I from seeing Black Panther in uh, Civil War, I really, I definitely grew a liking to the character. I just, I like the look. I like the idea they've gone for the Black Panther. And after watching this, I've got to say the storyline, like you were saying, is really good, really strong story behind it. Got some amazing visual effects in there as well. Oh, it's stunning. Really like it. it's, it's absolutely ab- stunning. The cast are brilliant, you know, absolutely brilliant in their roles. Again, feel like they were absolutely just written for those particular actors. They've done a really, really good job with this film. They really have. I really liked this one. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go eight and a half out of ten Same for that here. one. Um, absolutely spot on. I think my favourite so far. I mean, we've we've still got uh, five films to go as it stands, um, but I think my uh, my favourite so far of the marathon, the standout for me, has been Civil War, which is a surprise. Um, but I'm I'm looking forward to uh, bringing it in one more tonight and then four more tomorrow. And um, we've um, we've spent the last three or four days, however long it's been doing this marathon, but it's been great. Black Panther. I'm sure you've seen it, but if you've not. I, I mm. thoroughly recommend it. it yeah. It's just a fantastic film. Really looking forward to the, the sequel coming out in 2022. Mm-hmm. So we've just, um, last night, watched Avengers uh, Infinity War. Uh, we decided to do the vlog again next morning. We were both absolutely shattered after it. Uh, so it was uh, it was going on for, I think it was after one o'clock by the time it had, uh, by the time it had finished. So we thought, do you know what? We'll sleep on it. Give us fresh thoughts in the morning. The The film carries on immediately, uh, minutes after Thor Ragnarok finishes. Uh, the um, the ship that the Asgardians uh, intercept along the uh, along their way to Earth is Thanos. He lays waste to um, to them in search of, obviously, his uh, quest for the Infinity Stones. They um, end up sort of meeting the Guardians of the Galaxy along the way... Um, Bruce Banner ends up getting transported back to uh, back to Earth to warn the Avengers that Thanos is coming, um, and learns that since his exile, that the Avengers have broken up. They're not really a team anymore, and superheroes aren't really operating uh, in the way uh, that they were when when Banner last left. Um, Thanos's minions appear on Earth to try and get the um, I think it's the Time Stone, isn't it, from mm. Doctor Strange? Um, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Spider Man, and Wong put up a put up a fight for it. Um, it ends up with the Spider Man and um, Iron Man and Doctor Strange then jumping aboard Thanos' ship and, and taking the fight to him back on his home planet of Titan. Captain America, uh, Vision and all the rest of the uh, the team come out of their their hiding, their exile, their house arrests to uh, basically, you know, try and uh, sort the problem left back on Earth and uh, end up taking the fight to Wakanda. Uh, teaming up with Black Panther and the Wakandan army, and ultimately, as we all know, Thanos is successful, and uh, half the people in the world disappear. So uh, that's that's basically the the overview of the uh, overview of the plot. It, it's done really, really well. Um, the I, I can't remember the screenwriter's name, but I'm going to pop them underneath. Um, 
but but them alongside the Russo brothers that have directed this this movie and did the last two Captain America movies and they'll obviously go on to do do Endgame. They've really got a, a feel for how these superhero ensemble movies need to work and every character's given just enough screen time and the justification's all there and nothing feels rushed. It's really good. Mm. Um, it's really great because obviously there aren't many many feats of, of cinema. You know, even though these are just sort of popcorn fun and you know spectacle cinema and stuff like that, there aren't there aren't many feats of cinema where there's you know twenty odd films in a franchise that tell one continuing story and you get to see these characters grow and grow and grow. You know, even things like the Godzilla films or the the James Bond films or whatever don't really have overarching stories that continue throughout the entire tenure of the run. Whereas you know, obviously these lot do, and it's great to see the likes of Captain America go from a you know, he um, he wants someone to just look at somebody the wrong way, sort of character to, you know, well, in this one, they say, right, well, you're court-martialed when you do that, and he's like, do I care? Um, and, and that sort of character development and uh, and sort of Tony Stark, almost the opposite. When we meet him in Iron Man, he's, you know, he's very mm-hmm. brazen, just doesn't care, and he's, you know, well, he'll do anything regardless of how it might make somebody else feel or, or the consequences of the actions and then by the time we get to this point he's very methodical in terms of right well you know what's going to be the, the, the death toll and how's that going to impact people and don't get me wrong obviously he's still Tony Stark and he's still got that air of arrogance that we all love about him but do you know mm, what I mean yeah, yeah. What, what did you think Laura you know, you've seen this one with me once before but what, what did you yeah, think watching well, it in series oh wow that's uh, well it's been a it's been a hell of a series I'll say that the di- like you said different stories about uh, the different heroes but all coming together in this film to obviously stop one greater force um, yeah the progression with the different characters and their different story acts as you were saying about Captain America mm. and everything like that I love how they've all progressed in their own ways as well but I think what I liked about this film is you've got not just focusing on one particular group of people trying to stop Thanos, you've got four or five different stories all coming together in the end in what is... Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and then obviously the, you know, the, the, the end of Endgame, as we all know, is where everybody finally gets back together and, uh, you know, they, they go for one... Mm. one hell of an assault sort of thing. But yeah, absolutely, it's, it's brilliant as well, isn't it? You know, he just goes like yeah, that. And you, just one simple gesture and... Half the universe is gone. Yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. It's not often that you you see it where the bad guy says, "Well, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to go and sit on the hillside and watch the sunset." And the final scene of the film is sitting on the hillside watching the sunset, and it's like. I think what I love about how that particular scene was delivered was, yeah, you know, it's all just calm. It's all silent. People just start turning to dust. There's no big atmosphere in it it's all just silent yeah there's it's no kind of, like bombastic score yeah. or anything like that it's like you say it's very just that's what I really love how beautifully that scene was delivered definitely yeah especially what happens to Tony Stark and you know Peter Parker and how upsetting to see that how upsetting it is to see that because Tony Stark feels like he's failed you know because it was his job to protect Peter Parker more or less and he feels like he's failed that you know that's heartbreaking to watch is that yeah. It really, really, really is. It does have some some very moving mm. and poignant moments, mm. and it's just just a, a really good piece of cinema. Um, really, really happy to to watch it. And yeah. uh, we keep looking over there. We've got the stack <laughs> of the films, and uh, so just looking at the journey that we've been on. Obviously, we've got Ant Man and the Wasp ready to go this morning, and then we've Captain Marvel, End Game, and then Far from uh, Yeah, Far from Home. It's called, isn't far it? Far from yeah? Home. Yeah. Um, which is. Um, I almost toyed with just ending it at Endgame, but it'd bug me if we did a marathon yeah, we didn't and one of them was the newest Spider-Man movie. Yeah, it, it just bugged me if I knew that there was one we could have watched and should have watched but yeah. didn't. But it's, I bet that's going to feel like a bit of an anticlimax. To be fair, yeah. Um, after watching Endgame, but we'll we'll see. Anyway, ratings time. I'm going to go eight and a half for uh, Infinity War. Mm, I think just for that ending scene after Thanos snaps his fingers again, just how beautifully that was delivered. I'm going to go eight and a half as well. Definitely. Oh, there we go. Well, we'll see you after Ant-Man and the Wasp. We've just watched Ant-Man and the Wasp, so uh, we're on to Captain Marvel in uh, in just a moment's time. This film runs concurrently to the plot of Avengers Infinity War. And, um, well, I'd say concurrently. Uh, it, it all ends at the, uh, at the same point. Um, after the events of uh, Captain America Civil War, 
Um, Scott Lang's taken a plea deal and has gone on to house arrest for two years and uh, willingly agreed to not don the mantle of Iron, not Iron Man, Ant-Man uh, again, uh, or otherwise he'd be, be locked up for, for 20 years. So he's, he's in house arrest, everything's doing fine, and then all of a sudden he gets a vision of Janet Van Dyne, who's um, obviously Hank Pym's wife, played in this film by Michelle Pfeiffer, um, that, that prompts him to uh, to contact uh, Hank and Hope after being estranged from them for uh, for two years after the events in uh, in Civil War. Um, that gets the band back together, um, and they uh, they start plotting uh, a course to retrieve uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's character Janet from the uh, the quantum realm. Uh, separately to that, there's a character called Ghost, uh, who's sort of the villain, or well, one of the villains of the piece, a bit of a conflicted character that wants basically the the technology uh, from the Pym family to uh, to be able to stabilise her own her own body after being um, subjected uh, sort of inadvertently to uh, the uh, the side effects of an experiment when she was a, a young girl and her, her family died. Um, this means that she's on a molecular level unstable uh, and is slowly dying due to the uh, the experiment that she was exposed to. So she's desperately trying to uh, sort herself out basically and so that that's her motivation the FBI are constantly watching Scott and obviously making sure that he's not becoming Ant-Man obviously evades them with the help of um, Hank Pym and Hope as well as uh, Luis and, uh, and Dave the uh, the chaps from the first film that he was, uh, he was in prison with he's now started a business with again I really like the fact that this one just sort of takes a step back and does its own sort of almost self-contained thing it makes reference obviously to what's gone before it and and plays within those rules but it's again really just a this time instead of it being a heist movie it's a bit of a cat and mouse movie wouldn't you say Laura? Mm, Definitely yeah I really liked it yeah uh, I like the turn they've taken with this film instead of making the story about some outside threat wanting to threaten the city and uh, the two main characters having to don their suits again They've decided to focus it more on trying to bring uh, Hope's mother back. And I really like how they've taken a turn for the personal side of the characters and everything. And how they've managed, wanted to use that energy and... Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I really love... I, I just I love this this you know this franchise or mm. this, this part of the franchise. I think the, uh, the characters are really interesting and the, sort of the action mixed with comedy. Like you say, with a little bit of emotion in mm, there as well. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like it, what they've done there. It's done really well. Um, I'm going to give this, I think, uh, a 7.5 out of 10. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give it a 7.5 as well, definitely, yeah. There we go. We're not disagreeing much, are we? No, not really, no. <laughs> but uh, there you go. So we're on Captain Marvel next, and we'll see you after that. So we've just watched Captain Marvel, uh, the final film in the saga before we get to Avengers Endgame. Uh, we follow Brie Larson's Captain Marvel, uh, Carol Danvers, as she discovers her sort of true identity. She believes that she's initially a Kree soldier uh, fighting in their war against the Skrulls. She actually learns that she's human, she's from Earth, she's been working alongside not only the American Air Force but also uh, renowned Kree scientist Marvell um, to basically work on an energy source that will, will end the war for, for good. She ends up uh, in an explosion, loses her memories and is, is recruited by, by the Kree to become one of their warriors and has no memory of the fact that she's human until she ends up on Earth again. After an altercation with the Skrulls, she ends up teaming up with Nick Fury and they go on the journey together to find out where she is, who she is and uh, where she's come from, where Marvel is now um, or where Marvel's technology is now. And and that leads us on there. There's there's twists, there's turns with the characters. Characters you think are good or are bad, and vice versa. It's just a real good adventure sci-fi flick that again it does just more world building and uh, character development for the for the MCU. Brie Larson's a fantastic lead. The supporting cast are fantastic. Ben Mendelsohn as Taylor. So we've got Jude Law. I forget the character's name, but he plays the the leader of the. The squadron that she's part of, that Captain Marvel is part of, when she's uh, when she's a Kree warrior, and he's sort of a mentor to her at the beginning of the film, and it's sort of revealed halfway through that not only his but the entire people that they're from, um, motives aren't exactly, you know, that they're not decent people. They're uh, 
they're fighting on the wrong side of the battle and Captain Marvel learns as she goes through she's reunited with her, her close friends, her family um, for want of a better turn of phrase really, on Earth uh, with the Rambo family and and like I say, you know, has that, that sort of um, begins that trusted relationship with, with Nick Fury and to a lesser extent Agent Coulson as well the whole film works really well as a time capsule piece. Obviously, it's been set in the nineties, and they they absolutely capture that era fantastically. Like I say, the the story itself is just just great fun, and uh, you know a real good like I say adventure movie with all the sci-fi and the action and the fantasy just brilliantly woven into it. It sets the scene um, brilliantly for where Captain Marvel will will factor into Endgame as well. What did you think? I really liked it, yeah. Um, Brie Larson, she does a really good job as her character. She's just, she knows the balance between witty and serious. You know, she has crap backs for certain characters. Uh, we're introduced to the Tesseract as well. Uh, obviously back then they don't know just how much of an importance this this item is. And I like that because it really sets that up as well. The age progression on uh, Samuel Jackson works really well. I mean, obviously it's supposed to be young him from about 20 odd years ago, but we're introduced to how he loses his eye. And it he, he just, it looks really good how they've done it. Works really, really well. I really liked it. Definitely a lot of action and things like that in it. I liked it. I really did like it. It's definitely a really, I'd watch that again. I'd watch Absolutely, it again. yeah. One of, one of my favourites of the of the recent Marvel movies. I, I enjoy them all, to be fair. I think the only one that, I, well, the only one I, I don't really enjoy is Thor Dark World. I just, I find that one a little mm. bit tedious. Doctor Strange, I've got to be in the mood for it. When we watched it this time around, I, I, I could have happily skipped it and said we'd not bothered, but that's, that's not how a movie marathon works. Yeah. Um, but no, I re- really love love this one. Yeah. I really look forward to see where they take this in the in the future. Uh, you know, with with sequels as well, and, and hopefully she'll she'll have her many many own sequels as well as you know mm. more Avengers led movies and things like that, and, and team ups. Uh, really, really compelling and interesting character. This movie definitely gets you ready for Endgame as well because there's uh, is it mid? It's the mid credits, yeah. Mid credits scene. Uh, obviously, they, the the Avengers, or what's left of them, have found the pager that was left by Fury, and it just sets her up because she just stands behind the Black Widow and says, "Where's Fury?" and it leaves it at that, and it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, gets you ready for it. Absolutely, it sort of really just sort of lets you, you know, sort of, right, we're 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 ready now. We've mm. we've got there. Like I say again, just a brilliant sort of the whole cinematic universe mm. is fantastic feat of uh, modern cinema, really. The fact that they're able to get, you know, obviously a story that started, you know, obviously te- over ten years ago at this point, and tie everything together and have such a such a brilliant idea to bring it all together, and you can you, you can't tell rather, I should say, that a lot of this has been done on the fly. Like I said, the first Iron Man was very much a well, if it succeeds, it succeeds, and if it doesn't, we tried, and mm. and you can tell that there's that sort of. Probably up to the first Avengers, there's there's that sort of a well. If we need to leave it here, this is where we leave it, sort of thing. And then, obviously, you know, I'm sure it's been more planned out phase by phase from there on, and they'll have had this overarching story. But I, I just really love the fact that you know, like I said, that even all the franchises that that can rival it in terms of entries, like the Bond series or Godzilla, are the the two that spring to mind. There's that that continuity that's in this and the. You know, there's the same actors playing the same characters, and that's sort of, it. It's it really is just a, a marvel uh, of itself. Excuse the excuse the pun. Uh, I'm gonna go eight out of ten for this one. I'm gonna go uh, seven and a half. Seven and a half. So there we go. So we're gonna jump on to Avengers Endgame, which is what we've been working up to. Mm-hmm. Two films left. We are gonna watch Far From Home after it as well as a I suppose a little bit of an epilogue to the to the whole thing. But yeah, an eight from me, seven and a half from Laura, and we will see you after Endgame. Wow, well there we go. We've uh, we've just watched Avengers Endgame, which is really, I suppose, it's the final story in in the MCU today. Uh, we've obviously got the the epilogue, if you like, that is so far Spider Man Far From Home. Um, wow. So yeah, obviously, uh, after the events of uh, of Infinity War, the remaining team. Um, you know, try and adapt to life after the snap, and only when uh, Scott Lang manages to return from the quantum realm do they think they might have a chance of, uh, you know, saving everybody. So they they 
devise a way to travel through time and and attempt to get the Infinity Stones before Thanos can uh, can get them to bring everybody back. And while they succeed, it comes at a cost. Obviously, uh, Tony Stark makes that final sacrifice play and uh, and gives his life to make sure that everybody else can live. Really well done. Um, really, really well done film. Absolutely amazing. Um, superb acting. Uh, some absolutely stellar performances. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is an absolute heavyweight throughout this series, as we know. Mm. Uh, but he put in an absolutely fantastic performance. Chris Evans, Matt Ruffalo, obviously uh, Chris Hemsworth, um, Scarlett Johansson. Um, obviously, Jeremy Renner returns for this one as well. The the six core Avengers absolutely absolutely fantastic. This film, as we, I'm sure everybody who's watching this has seen it, but you know it's got action, it's got the adventure, it's got the sci-fi, got the fantasy, it's got the moving stuff as well. Um, the death scene, the funeral scene, really, really heart, heart you know, not heartwarming, but it really moving, uh, really moving stuff. Um, and just just what a fantastic culmination yeah. of of a decade's worth of storytelling, it's a comic book movie done right. Definitely, absolutely. Um, what would you say, Laura? Oh, just what a what an ending! Absolutely, just what a perfect end to a decade of superhero films. Really well done. Really put together. Everybody coming together at the end. That scene where. Yeah, Doctor Strange opens up all those holes and everybody comes flowing through. Yeah, could not have played that any better. You and I were both saying we were getting chills watching that. Yeah, it's a real goosebumps moment, isn't it? You know, you you hear the the radio crackling back into life in Cap's ear. And it's you know you hear the on your left and you know, everybody. everybody through. Yeah, I gotta say everybody putting in amazing performance and credit where it's due. Joss Brolin absolutely perfect as Thanos I don't think anybody could have done that role better than him no uh, absolutely fantastic absolutely villain you, you, a villain that you love to hate mm. um, you know he's, um, he's he's up there with uh, you know with the likes of Umbridge as, uh, mm. as villains that you know you just detest I still hate her more <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think everybody does to be mm. fair don't they um, yeah. but no um, absolutely stellar bit of filmmaking credit to uh to all that were involved, the writers, the directors, the composers. I mean, we've not really talked. Alan Silvestri composes quite a lot of mm-hmm. the. He composed this, and he's composed quite a lot of them along the along the way. And some of the themes and the scores that he's brought to life for these characters, as as, as the other composers have. You know, the directors. You've got the Russo brothers, uh, John Favreau, Kenneth Branagh, uh, Peyton Reed, uh, Scott Derrickson. So many directors along the way that have done absolutely fantastic jobs. Um, you know, to like I say, to to bring this this united vision all together, mm. I'm gonna give that a nine out of ten. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a nine out of ten as well. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely fantastic, and I suppose at this point now, for maybe five days in, we're uh, we're in we're in isolation at the uh, at the moment, which is why we decided we'd uh, we'd take the time Finally to do this. Finally, give it a go, yeah. Um, I'm not too sure actually how long we've been at this. I think it's four days. Four or five days at the least, yeah. But um, we've got the one film left now, if you like. It's the epilogue to the whole piece. And, uh, and that is Spider-Man Far From Home, so we'll we'll come back after that. We've done. Yeah. We have, haven't we? Mm-hmm. Finished it. So the sort of like, if you like, the epilogue of the piece for now um, is Spider-Man Far From Home. Obviously, it follows on from the events of Endgame. Uh, Spider-Man sort of coming to terms with a world without Tony Stark. He just wants to have a, a normal summer after a school year with his friends and readjusting to life after five years in the snap. Obviously, on the school trip, gets recruited by Nick Fury to assist new superhero Mysterio um, in defeating the elementals that have come from a multiverse. Turns out, as we all know, that Mysterio is the the bad guy and is is nothing more than an illusionist and a con artist, and ends up obviously having the two of them battle. Do you know what? I I enjoyed this a whole lot more this time watching it in series. I I missed this one in the cinema, um, not not by choice, but but picked the Blu-ray up when it came out and watched it. And whilst I thought it was okay, I was sort of like. Mm nothing special sort of thing but I actually really enjoyed it a whole lot more as as part of the whole you know overarching story 
Uh, I'm interested to see where they go for Spider-Man 3. Uh, I do think now at this point, I'm, I'm sure they won't, but I, I'd prefer the Marvel movies to, to stick to, mm-hmm. you know, standalone tales for now and not, not worry about bringing, you know, this person from that universe and so on and so forth into it and yeah. just, you know, make some, some really good standalone tales, which I think they're going to do. Rumour has it that Daredevil is going to be Spider-Man's lawyer in the uh, in the third one. They're going to bring, um, is it Charlie Cox back from the, the Daredevil TV show? They did that set in the MCU, so that that be be interesting mm-hmm. if they do that. And uh, is it Craven the uh, the hunter is going to be the the villain? At least they're, they're talking about that anyway. It's going to be sort of Spider Man on the on the run. I think the, the rumored title for the third one might be Spider Man Home Run or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm going to give that. Uh, six and a half out of ten. Mm. I, I enjoyed it. Laura, what did you think of it? I definitely thought this was a bittersweet ending. I mean, it's a really good epilogue for Spider-Man. I like how they've not just made it a standalone film. They've added bits in from Endgame. You know, as you were saying, he's recovering from you know having been stuck five years after Thanos and everything, and how he's trying to recover from that, but also from Tony Stark's death because he's basically lost a father figure. So he's having to come to terms with that. So you can understand why he'd want to try and have a normal summer. He'd want to try and spend it with his friends and not have to do any hero work. So, And you can see that throughout the film. He really doesn't want to join in to begin with. But then when he finds out what Mysterio's really up to and everything, yeah, really, really good film, good storyline on it. I'm going to give it... I'm going to give it a seven and a half. Okay, well, there we go. Mm. Well, thank you very much for, for watching this vlog. Uh, I've, as recording it, I don't quite know how I'm going to edit it. It might be one sort of feature-length vlog. It might be two or three shorter vlogs, all sort of, uh, you know, cut down for size. But uh, however however it ends up coming to you, thanks very much for, for watching our ramblings. We've done this whilst in uh, self-isolation on the... Uh, the back of the the pandemic that's going on in the world at the moment. Uh, I won't mention it by name because apparently that gets uh, videos taken down from YouTube. Mm. I don't know whether that's true or a, a myth, but we're not we're not risking it. Um, but yeah, so this has just been our ramblings with a week where we've not been able to to leave the house. Um, we've very much enjoyed watching these films. I hope you've enjoyed watching the you know this vlog or these vlogs if there's been more than one. Folks, stay safe, um, take care of yourselves and all that, and I will see you again soon. If you've liked uh, what you've seen today, give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on it all, and like I say, take very good care.